All right, Jessica, take it away when you're ready. Okay, good evening. Second, all right. Uh, welcome everyone to the Bicycling, Transportation and Street Safety Commission meeting on January 12, 2023. I'm calling this meeting to order at 5.30. Uh, Jennifer, would you please do a roll call? Sure, Skyler. Here. Perfect. Uh, uh, Jessica. Here. Keshev. Here. Brett. Oh, did you say here? I didn't hear it. Um. Um. Yeah, I said here. Uh, oh, sorry. That's okay. Jackson. Here. Brooke. Here. And Andy. Oh, Andy, I can't hear you. Hi, I'm here. Excellent. I see. <laughs> All right. Being late. So Jessica, I'll take over for a second because the first order of business is to introduce our new members and then also each member is going to be doing an oath of office. And so the first person that I, I would like to introduce is uh, Skylar Campbell and Skylar after you're done introducing yourself, I'm going to have you read your oath of office and then um, we'll go to Andy. And for the introductions, if you'd be willing to just talk a bit about how long you've been in Davis, what you do outside of the commission and what interested you in the commission, that would be helpful for everyone to know. Uh, so I'm Skylar Campbell. I've uh, lived in Davis a few different times, actually, initially. Um, I went to UCD undergrad until 05. I came back when my, um, my wife, my then girlfriend, who I was in grad school here, and then we moved back here with uh, with our kid and then had another kid um, about two years ago, a little less than a year and a half ago. Um, my wife actually is a Davis native. She she grew up here, uh, went to public school here and everything. I'm an attorney. Um, and uh, some of my background as an attorney actually is in uh, transit. I used to be uh, um, an attorney for Sacramento Regional Transit District. And so I have some... Um, background in transportation and transportation policy. And I currently re represent um, public agencies uh, as an attorney for Chronic Mosque of the Cedar in Girard. Oh. And pretty familiar with uh, these meetings. And I thought this seemed like uh, something that I, I could do and could help um, support my community and uh, help uh, guide policy in a, in a good, good direction. Great. Thank you so much. So now here is your oath of office. So if you wouldn't mind raising your right hand and then reading the oath of office, can you read it okay? Yes. Okay. I, Skylar Campbell, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies, foreign and domestic that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States and to the Constitution of the State of California, that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. Great, thank you so much. And I'm gonna send this to you and then ask you to sign it and then return it back to me. Okay. All right, next we have up Andy. Andy, please introduce yourself. Hi, so I'm Andy Ferrillo. Uh, I uh, grew up here in Davis, uh, and then I lived uh, been, lived in a couple of different places for college and grad school, and then in uh, DC for several years before I moved back here in uh, the middle of the pandemic in 2020. Uh, so my interest in uh, transportation. So I mean, I mainly use like transit, biking, walking to get around. So of course, I'm very interested in. Uh, like, of course, I'm very interested in really becoming an advocate for uh, improving those modes. And through that, uh, I, I serve on uh, the, Yolo, the Yolo County Transportation District uh, Citizens Advisory Committee. And also, I had been on the Unitrans Advisory Committee here in town before switching to uh, this commission uh, just at the start of this year. Uh, and in addition to that, I also uh, work in transit. I'm in Caltrans's uh, Rail and Mass Transportation Division uh, doing uh, strategic management there. So with that, happy to be a part of the BTSSC. Thanks a lot, Andy. All right, here is your oath of office. 
Thank you. I, Andy Ferrillo, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I'll bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. That I take, take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully dis discharge the duties upon which I'm about to enter. Great, thank you so much. And then finally, Brett, please introduce yourself. Um, hi, I'm Brett Lee. I, uh, as a kid, I went to elementary school in Davis for a few years and sort of um, my grandparents have always lived here. And I used to spend my summers uh, here as a kid growing up. And kind of Davis has always been kind of uh, what I consider home. I've lived in a bunch of different other places, but um, in 2019, I returned 2019, no, 1999, returned to Davis and sort of permanently have sort of stayed here ever since. But uh, yeah, as a kid, I kind of grew up in Davis in the late 60s. Uh, anyway, I, I was on the city council for eight years and was a liaison to a variety of commissions. Uh, prior to being on the city council, um, bicycle infrastructure has always kind of uh, interested me especially as a person making use of all the, the bike paths and things. Um, after coming off the council, I wanted to stay involved and sort of work on improving some of the infrastructure. Um, when I was on council, we had a couple of uh, oopses, like oops, uh, O-O-P-S uh, kind of experiences. And through sort of uh, reflection and investigation, tried to figure out how with good intentions, we sort of came up with some fairly mediocre or not so great projects. Um, and and uh, just kind of, I'll share more details of that with you, I'm sure at some point. Uh, uh, Jennifer was uh, not responsible and neither was Ryan. So that, you know, the, the, the oopses occurred in the process at various other points. Um, <laughs> so I'm happy to be here with Jennifer and, uh, uh, you know, look forward to working with Ryan and, and all of you. Uh, but anyway, um, I'm kind of rambling a bit, but uh, being on this, the city council as a liaison to variety commissions, I, I saw what really important work they were doing. And so I'm really enthusiastic about being on the BTSSC and, uh, you know, working with you guys. Thank you, Brett. And then here is your oath of office. Um, I, Brett Lee, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California, that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. Great, thank you so much. All right, back to presentation mode. Switch my display. Okay, let's carry on. All right, Jessica. And I would just like to thank Skylar, Andy, and Brett for dedicating your time and skills and experience to the BTSSC. We're really happy to have you join us and welcome. Um, so the next agenda item is the approval of the agenda. Um, I'm seeking a motion to approve the agenda. Go ahead, Keisha. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda. Would anyone like um, to second I'll, I'll, I'll second that. OK, Jennifer, would you please do a roll call for the agenda? Yep, Skylar. Aye. Andy. I, and I just want to make sure I am voting on that, because I know with. You are, you are. <laughs> OK, aye. <laughs> nice. But good, thank you for asking. Uh, Jessica. Aye. Keshav. Aye. Brett. Aye. Jackson. Aye. And Brooke. Aye. All right. <laughs> Moving on. Okay. Agenda item four is brief announcements from staff and liaisons. Um, this is the time for brief announcements. Commissioners will have an opportunity to make their own brief announcements during commissioner and subcommittee announcements later in the agenda. 
Um, should we start with the council liaison announcements? Do we have a uh, council representative? We do not. Josh is not here with us tonight. So I'm going to hand it over to Ryan. Okay. Hi, uh, Ryan Chapman. I'm the Assistant Director of Public Works with Engineering and Transportation. And I do have a couple of things I would like to share with you. The first one is actually the picture before you, which is the uh, left turn only sign that was installed at the intersection of Third and University. We had an issue with cut through traffic, essentially people going through at this intersection, violating the uh, regulations that were already out there. So we have installed this as a kind of interim evaluation. It's mounted down onto the road there, and we are observing it to see if that helps address the compliance issues. Um, and then I had a couple updates about some community meetings. The first one actually happened last Monday. Monday. I met with a bunch of the residents in the cannery and had a town hall meeting where we discussed some of their traffic concerns. And we'll be working with them on addressing issues to solve a lot of the uh, concerns. And you will see various items relating to that coming across your agenda over the coming months. A lot of their concerns were really related to speeding on Cannery Loop and then issues with site distance at some of the intersections with Cannery Loop, as well as some visibility and concerns about a couple of crosswalks in the community. We have a meeting on February 2nd um, to talk about Fifth Street. You'll be getting an invite if you want to attend that. And this is Fifth Street between L Street and Cantrell. We have a demo project right now from L Street Hall Line that looked at a road diet reducing the lanes on Fifth Street from four to two and adding bicycle lanes. This will be a report on that, as well as a corridor study we are pursuing that would formalize that treatment and some options to implement a more permanent uh, solution. And then there will be a March 6th meeting on about the 14th Street Villanova project between F Street and Sycamore. And this will be a discussion of what our project is there, relaunching that project, and then talking about some of the results from the demonstration project that occurred there last year, especially around uh, F and Oak. Those are my updates. Great. And then Jessica, you asked me to, hold on, I have to get out of this mode, to give an update on the service request. So I'm going to, I'm on the city website. It's at cityofdavis.org is the, our website. And then we have this orange button here called make a service request. So if you see an issue with a tree down on a pathway or a light out or graffiti, this is a, one of the ways you can make a request. So you click on the orange button. And then you can input your new issue right here by clicking here. You pick what kind of issue it is. Say it's city infrastructure. It's a sign that you see dangling. Then you G. Then you tell the where the sign was. Where my so where I am now is this dot. And then you can post where that the issue is. You can also include photos. So that's one way to do it. The other way is that we actually have a phone application called My Davis. So if you go in the app store and look for My Davis, you can download the app. And I use this for work all the time. It actually geolocates your issue. And so you're able to show where you are, take a photo of it. You can insert your photos directly from your phone. And it's a great way to show, um, to send issues to uh, the city. And it then it gets directed to the right department once we receive it. Do you have any questions about that, anyone? No. Okay. Have you used it? No. All right. I have, I have downloaded it, so I have it ready. Awesome. Well, that's the start. <laughs> Great. Okay. Let's go back here. Okay. Let's do this. All right, Jessica. Okay. Thank you, Ryan and Jennifer. Um, we are now moving to public comment. At this time, any member of the public may address the commission on matters which are not listed on this agenda or are listed on the consent calendar. Speakers will be limited to no more than three minutes. 
Um, speakers will be asked to state their name for the record. And to speak, please use the raise your hand button or press star nine if you're using a phone. Does anyone want to speak for public comment? All right. Hearing none, Jessica, we're moving on. Okay. Then we'll move on to the consent calendar. Items on the consent calendar are non-controversial and can be approved with one motion. Would anyone like to make a motion to approve the consent calendar? I'll move to uh, approve the consent calendar. I'll second that. Great. So we'll go to a vote. Jessica? Aye. Keshev? Aye. And Jackson? Aye. And Brooke? Aye. So I've not included our new commissioners because you were not there for the uh, um, the eight, December 8th meeting. All right. Moving on. Okay, we'll now move to regular items, regular agenda items. For these items, we'll receive a presentation, then commissioners will have a chance to ask clarifying questions about the presentation and staff report. Please hold all comments and discussion until after we hear public comment. Commissioners must be open to new ideas and listen to public comment. After public comment, we can then discuss the item and provide our comments. Um, who, will it be Ryan that's provide that's presenting the first agenda item? Yes. Yep. Help. Oops. All right, Ryan. Yeah. So thank you. So yes, yeah, so the first item is a discussion about the continued closure of G Street. And this is between 2nd and 3rd Streets. And just a bit of history, the portion of G Street was closed to automobile traffic in response to COVID restrictions, and it created an opportunity for some outdoor dining and shopping. Since then, minor changes have occurred. Um, we replaced a bunch of the road closed signage with some bollards. And at the south end, we relocated the point of the closure to open up the parking lot off of G Street. And this is just a map. Here's 2nd Street. Here's 3rd. You can see in the area of the bollards. And then they're placed here to allow people access to this parking lot. And this is the current configuration for the closure right now. Um, so we are. We've, uh, we've been tasked with looking at this and bringing something forward so a can discussion can occur and we can decide how we want to move forward with G Street. And as part of this, we developed four options that we are looking at, and we have been presenting them to various stakeholders in the community, including the residents that front the area that's closed, not residents, excuse me, businesses that front the area that is closed. Uh, the Downtown Davis Business Association, the Chamber of Commerce, and we are discussing it with you now. Um, as part of the outreach summary, there have been concerns about the appearance of G Street as it is today, um, that there's a lack of standards, there's a lot of use of temporary materials, and it just really creates an uncohesive appearance for the areas where there have been permits or outdoor dining established. There's been concerns expressed about the cleanliness along G Street and the questions about who maintains what portions of the area and how it is being maintained. There have been concerns raised about the equality, um, who is getting the permits and how much do those permits cost. And there have been concerns raised about access, and this is really related to the lack of automobile access and the restriction of parking. And that's really a summary of the concerns that we've been receiving from the community. Um, so the first option we looked at would be reopen G Street, and this would probably be the quickest to implement and would restore the street to what it was prior to COVID. That would be two automobile travel lanes, 
and angled parking on each side of the street. This would re require removing all the materials that are currently on the street and the bollards. The second option would be keep the street closed. And this would include developing a set of standards for outdoor retail and dining, identifying the responsibilities for who would be maintaining the areas, such as litter removal and regular sweeping, identify the costs and fees associated with permitting these outdoor dining areas, and then identifying what we would have to do to maintain emergency vehicle access. Um, the third option would be reopen the road, but allow for full closures. And this really would be kind of temporary closures. So the road might be open for during weekdays, but during the weekends it would be closed to allow some sort of outdoor dining or the road could be closed for various special events that might occur throughout the year. Um, while the road's opened, it would be two travel lanes and angled parking. Um, one of the things that we did hear about this is there would be a need to address the temporary nature of the furniture, street furniture that would have to be out there. Since it couldn't be out all the time, we'd be looking at folding chairs or tables, and we would have to work through who would be storing those and placing them as the road is open and closed. And the fourth option that we presented was to reopen the northbound lane only. And this would allow for expanded sidewalk and patio space. This would allow for some automobile access and parking. Um, and we would need to determine what other features we would want on the road. For example, would we want a southbound bicycle lane or additional parking on the left side of the travel lane? Um, just staying on this slide briefly, excuse me. Um, when we talked to the businesses, there was not a clear consensus over what one of these alternatives was preferred or not. And it was kind of a hodgepodge depending on the business and their specific needs. The other thing I wanted to bring to you is during discussions, we have heard that a lot of automobiles come down the portion of G Street that's, G Street that's open to the closure, either park or try to turn around and then exit this way. And as an interim measure, while we work through what we want to do, we could look at installing an additional sign that essentially would stay H Street this way and then include an arrow as well as pavement markers through this parking lot to help kind of guide traffic through the parking lot to get out instead of trying to make a multi-point turn and turn around here. If we do decide to keep the street closed or look at like a one-way option, in the future, it would be worth considering converting this angled parking so it faced the other direction so drivers heading north could back in and out of it. So as far as the schedule, we are talking to you today and this is to be presented before the city council on January 17th, which is next Tuesday. And we are looking for recommendations. We're looking for input from the BTSSC on the alternative alternatives that were provided. Is there anything that you see that you like or dislike? Is there anything that needs to be modified or changed? Are there alternatives that we should probably consider that we haven't looked at? And I'm also looking for feedback related to the proposed interim changes, and if that is something that the BTSS would support. Uh, well, if I could start by saying, um, just to, I just to make sure, agree. Skylar, just to make sure this would be the time to ask any clarifying questions, um, but any comments or opinions would come oh, after. I, I see. Uh, apologies. Okay, you mentioned something, uh, this would be a clarifying question about the um, parking facility towards the end of your presentation, you mentioned something about how theoretically that make it easier to access while still keeping the road closed. I'm sorry, you were breaking up a little bit. Could you please repeat your question? Uh, yes, could you uh, maybe expand a little bit? on altering the uh, access to the parking lot that's currently difficult to get into and out of? Yes, so. Ryan, what, unfortunately they can't see your mouse, so I'll, I have to, I'll be the mouse. <laughs> okay, 
So um, currently the road's open two ways up until the parking lot. Up until here. And at the location there, approximately where the current public parking sign is, we would install a sign that says H Street and directs traffic into the parking lot. Yeah. Four white arrows on the ground through the parking lot would help guide and direct traffic through the parking lot so that people could exit on H Street. Um, if one of the decisions is to make G Street one way or keep G Street closed, there would be an option to look at making well, we would be making that block from Second Street to the closure or where it becomes one way, one way. And then the parking, angle parking that's on the left side of the street, we could convert to it being angled the other direction so that people would not have to turn around back in and out of it. The only reason I'm not recommending that at this time is it would require modifications to the municipal code through an ordinance. And if one of the options is to reopen it, it's not something I would like to have to do now and then undo once that decision is made. Commissioner Ferula. Thank you. Uh, so my question is, do you have any uh, like data or uh, analysis of like just how of like how the uh, increased access like for foot and bike traffic, but also like the reduced uh, ability to like drive down or park on the street uh, has impacted uh, any of these any of these uh, businesses or business in general on G Street? Unfortunately, I really don't have any data on how these changes have impacted those businesses. And I think it would be very difficult to kind of identify what the impacts of COVID are versus the impacts to the change in access. Commissioner um, Kumar. Hey Ryan, uh, this is maybe on along the same note, but did any business outwardly say in your outreach to them that they had been negatively impacted by the lack of parking available to their customers? Yes, we've heard from a couple of businesses that the lack of parking or the lack of automobile access has negatively affected their business. Great, that was my only question. Thank you. Commissioner Astor? Um, Yeah, Ryan, how many parking spaces would be recovered if the street were reopened to two-way traffic? And do you know if the business concern is specifically on the loss of parking on G Street or is it just loss of parking in the downtown in general? Because, I mean, it's not always possible to park directly in front of a business when you're going there. So, I mean, is it more of an overall parking issue or specific to the street? So for the first question, I counted about 45 parking spaces that would be restored if the street was fully reopened. And as far as whether it's just a lack of parking downtown in general versus specifically on G Street, I've actually heard both. Some businesses have expressed concerns that there's no parking immediately on that block for their customers to use, especially if they're purchasing items that they don't want to carry several blocks. I've also heard that just the reduction in parking downtown has been detrimental to downtown Davis as a whole. And I have one clarifying question. Um, you mentioned the outreach that you did to the businesses on the street and that you received mixed feedback in terms of their opinions. Do you have any um, data as to the opinions of the public and the users of the open space? Um, I've received some comment from the public in general. I've seen some, I've received some requests from, or some feedback, excuse me, from Bike Davis and some other stakeholders in the community. And then the Downtown Davis Business Association is currently running a survey of their membership to kind of look at what the businesses as a whole in the area feel about this. I don't have the results of that survey at the moment, but I expect they would be presented at the council meeting. Okay, are there any other clarifying questions? I think we can move to public comment. All right, well, we're going to open it up to public comment. If anyone would like to speak, they need to press star nine. Oh, got it. Go ahead, Daryl. 
Well, hello there and uh, Happy New Year and welcome to the new commissioners, especially that new guy, Brett. It's good to see you. Um, <clears throat> I would uh, like to request that we stop referring to a closed G Street. It is currently open. It's open to more uses than it's been historically open to. And the only thing that is prohibited is cars driving through. So we can filter it for cars. There's all kinds of ways to call it. It is not closed. Um, I know this because I go through there all the time. Uh, and I bring this up specifically because I just recently rode through a road closure signed road. It was Second Street after the storm. And I was yelled at because, in fact, the guy says, can't you read? So closed means you can't use the road. And we can use this, obviously. So uh, I challenge you all to avoid referring to vehicle restrictions as closed. And I know those of you who've worked with me and heard with <laughs> heard from me before, um, this is not new news to you. Uh, next is I'm amazed at how we arrived uh, with four options, and three of them include allowing cars through here again. Um, and there's not a single option of actually expanding the scope of this open street. Uh, I'd like to see a lot more effort put into having no motor vehicles allowed on the entire block, including that south end, because that would prevent all the frustration, the confusion, the danger presented by the drivers that enter into G Street from 2nd and get sort of stuck there and they're forced to make a U-turn or, you know, like an eight point turn, some of these guys in their big trucks. And then, or if they don't do that, they have to snake through the entire parking lot behind all of the parked cars trying to back out. And so this clog of cars causes all kinds of safety issues for the folks trying to ride through the open section of G Street where cars are prohibited. Um, it seems to me there has to be a way to make an in and an out on H Street and seal off the whole thing on G Street. So that's what I've got for you. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. All right, John, you have the floor. Okay, this is the first time with my new monitor. Am I okay? Well, yes, we can hear you. Excellent, that's all you need. Uh, I'm gonna say I absolutely, positively, definitely support option two. Keep it the way it is, but put up some signs to help direct the motor vehicles. Um, I think Davis has an unprecedented opportunity here to develop this region. There are already existing food and drink establishments that have taken advantage of the, uh, of the street. And we could make this something as beautiful as you see in other cities, or we could decide to just revert back the way it was and allow cars up and down the street, just like every other place and let the downtown die strangled by cars. Thank you. Thanks a lot, John. All right, Jeff, go ahead. All right, thank you. And can everyone hear me okay? I'm using a different microphone than usual. Yep. All right, good evening, um, commissioners and staff. Thank you for the time and the attention onto this detail. My name is Jeffrey Bruchet. I'm speaking as a member of the Bike Davis Board tonight. Um, I'd like to voice um, kind of an imp important attention to this space, especially this as a gathering space. Um, when we return to more fair weather, I'd like to phrase that and also appreciation to our public's work staff who's been working tirelessly over the last few weeks of really ridiculous climate weather. Um, I present this as a climate problem because I really believe that option two is the only suitable climate future on the table right now. I welcome the standards and improvements that are being presented in option two for the city blocks and how the, these changes can improve the livability to this street. I'd like to remind the commissioners that the street is built for people and people go to these businesses. The vehicles that these people drive do not go to these businesses. I believe that the street can flourish. And I think it can really be an example for the rest of downtown and be an example for how we can create a low stress network for people to move around downtown and engage with our local businesses. I support better striping, I support better signage, and I support the implementation of better language that talks about how this is space for our people and for our community, and it is not a closure. Uh, 
The closure is hostile. Consider more permissive language. Consider how we can say it's restricted to motor vehicle traffic, but available for business. And lastly, I'd really like to implore you that if you consider restoring parking in this area, that you do not restore free parking. Free parking is a problem in our climate future. Free parking reinforces motor vehicle use. And I think it is part of the climate action to, for Davis to improve our climate and reinforcing people's use of private motor vehicles will only bring us into climate hell. I thank you all for your time and attention tonight. Welcome to our new commissioners. I really look forward to y'all's continued discussion. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Um, Daryl, did you wanna speak again? Daryl? No, oh, oh okay. I, I thought my <laughs> hand was lowered for me, sorry. It's okay, no problem. Okay, Jessica. Okay, I also thought of one additional clarifying question. Can I ask that? Sure. Yeah. Um, one question would be, you mentioned um, the concern about emergency vehicle access. Have you had the opportunity to look at other communities with similar public spaces and um, see what kind of options have been used in those circumstances for emergency vehicle access? Um, I've done a little bit of research and I, I've worked for a couple of different agencies. Most often, especially fire response requires a 20 foot wide path of some sort through or around a closure like this in order to provide access. And that's kind of what we would be looking at. That is an area that doesn't necessarily have to be look like a road or be designated as such. It could be a pedestrian area. It would just be an area that would be clear of any furniture or anything else that might obstruct a vehicle if they have to remove the bollards and come in. Okay, great. Then we can move to commissioner discussion. Um, just a note, particularly for our new commissioners, um, the commission meetings serve as a public meeting and commissioners are being asked to make recommendations to staff, um, and, you know, and then this goes to city council. Um, so the staff is looking for the commission to make recommendations and not defer to others. This is a chance to share your opinions and your thoughts and um, for us to come up with a recommendation to the staff, which would be done in the form of a motion. If there's something specific that you want to propose, um, you can propose um, a motion. And if you have any questions as we're going through this, please feel free to ask. Um, Commissioner Mills? Yeah, um, well, thank you um, for the presentation, Ryan. And uh, I'll, I'll start, I'll just start with um, saying that I, you know, I, I totally support the um, additional lane changes and the, and the added signs to address um, potential driver confusion, I think. You know, that's absolutely warranted. Don't see a negative to that. Um, and then I also just want to throw my support entirely behind option two of keeping the street closed to automobile traffic. Um, I agree with what a lot of the public commenters were saying, where um, we really have to think about who we are closing the street to by if we were to reopen it to cars. Because currently, you know, 100% um, of the street block within the, the ball art section is uh, available space to use if you're a pedestrian and a cyclist. But if we reopen the street to cars, let's say 80 plus percent of that space uh, can only be used by cars and pedestrians and cyclists are relegated to just the sides of the street. And um, also just speaking from personal experience, it's um, I've had you know a lot of uh, really uh, fun times on that section of G Street on you know just hanging out with friends, not having to, worry about car traffic nearby you know it's it's a lot more peaceful there's less noise it's a lot more pleasant and i think we also have to consider um concerns related to climate change in terms of keeping this this street closed where um it's not my opinion that davis should be prioritizing automobile traffic in any fashion in, in downtown um, and that includes not um reopening the street and adding more free parking um to to downtown i think Davis deserves to have a, a an accessible, um, a a you know very lively pedestrian uh, street in in downtown and and um, so yeah that, those are just some general comments but yeah I I very much support 
option too. Uh, and, and I think we should definitely keep the street closed to, to automobile traffic. Thank you. Commissioner Furla. Thank you. So uh, I would like to uh, second uh, Jackson's comment of supporting option two, of course, uh, in clarifying signage and stuff like that for uh, redirecting traffic, but the supporting option two to keep that street uh, open to uh, people open to people and cyclists in the way that it is now. Uh, I think that, I mean, G Street, I mean, definitely it's like a very enjoyable place to be. I think that, and I think open the uh, open street there does a lot for it. A couple of personal examples. So uh, last weekend, actually, uh, we wanted to go eat like a, uh, the new Woodstock's pizza location on that street. Uh, unfortunately, like the weather was with the, when all the storms are moving through and whatnot. So you couldn't really sit outside. And that meant we actually wound up like not eating there because the rest of the inside of the restaurant like was so full when if the outside had been open. I mean, that's a situation where they lost business because they couldn't use the outside. And essentially, if you put traffic back on the street, you'd be they'd be losing that business permanently. So that's one example. Uh, another example of how uh, good business like good businesses couldn't succeed uh, on an open street is uh, this uh, coaster right here. Sorry, it's not showing up that well, but it's a so it's a bike. Sorry, it's kind if of you, blurring out. <laughs> Andy, if you unblur your background, then we can see it. But that works too. Oh yes, <laughs> I think you can kind of see it there. But uh, that's from the artery that uh, this coaster with the bike. Uh, and again, that's something that uh, we just got recently, like around Christmas time. So uh, again, another example of how I mean a lot of these business people are going to them, and definitely they're very, like, in succeeding, like in this time of uh, open streets. And that's something that's really backed up by research that shows that. Uh, the ability for foot traffic like to access businesses uh, really boosts them in a way that being that like having parking spots right in front of people being able to drive right in front doesn't uh, especially because I'd like to echo points that were made earlier that even if they're even if you are able to drive right past a business or park right in front of a business that does like you're not going to be it's the odds that you're going to be able to park like right in front of the business are quite low like even in somewhere like if you go to the Roseville Galleria or the Vacaville outlet malls like shopping are obviously very auto-centric facilities in a lot of places you're, I mean in much of the time you're going to be walking a longer way from your parking spot to the store you want to go to and one of those like very spread out type of facilities then you will be on G Street even if you drive and like park somewhere else downtown or whatnot rather than uh if your walk's still going to be shorter just in largely that's because like downtown Davis is a much more compact more bike friendly place more walking friendly place more transit friendly place because you have the train station right near there you have unitrans going right down second street and then lots of buses going down fifth street just a couple of blocks away so again with uh, that just would uh, like to support just throw my support by option two and i'd hope that uh not only that uh g street stays open but that this is something we can build on and potentially uh look for more opportunities for open streets in davis thank you commissioner campbell yes uh so <clears throat> first uh for uh we haven't actually heard the sort of opposing viewpoint uh and you won't really be hearing it from me either but i'll just say for those who who have an opposing viewpoint uh, i have a, a baby and a toddler um and i'm I, i'm in a certain life stage where parking is great for me but even i can see uh very 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 clearly um the the theoretical benefits even if we haven't really realized them all fully yet uh the theoretical benefits of having uh you know really nice um uh, pedestrian space uh downtown davis for being such a generally bike and pedestrian friendly place compared to most other sort of similar cities in california uh we do actually lack um sort of outdoor public spaces um besides kind of parks and uh, nature oriented places or places on campus i mean we've got a little a, that little spot um in the university avenue i think it is um where cafe roma used to be people remember that i used to live above it um but that um yeah so that's not a ton so g street the way it is i have to agree with people that it looks janky if uh if you're if you're out there a member of the public and you're thinking but it looks janky i can understand why um it wasn't you know fully engineered as a to, as a permanent solution 
right? I mean, this was, it looks like something that was designed to be temporary. And so I think option two and maybe the eventual, the eventuality if option two is, um, is where the city goes, uh, is that this gets taken maybe a little bit more seriously. Maybe it stops looking like a street that was closed to traffic uh, and starts looking like a proper pedestrian street. I know a lot of places, parts of Sacramento did this. Uh, pretty much all of central Copenhagen actually did this, I think in like the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and you can see a lot of benefits. Um, some of the cons, you know, people are talking about parking problems for businesses. Um, there are other parking solutions besides on-street parking. Um, you know, Santa Barbara, for example, closed some of its streets to traffic uh, and built parking garages. And that's that's something we don't currently have a lot of in downtown Davis. Perhaps that's something that can be considered. Um, but the the bigger issue to this that I sort of do think needs to be addressed is traffic flow. And signage helps to some extent. Um, but I would think that perhaps a little bit more um, engineering needs to needs to go into considering how to control traffic flow besides just uh, letting people know that they shouldn't turn a certain uh, street. Um, I'm not sure exactly um, how much work has been done on that end or would need to be done, but I think that that there are some solutions out there that don't involve uh, ruining sort of uh, what's, you know, not yet a great thing, but could be. Um, it Because it it does look janky, and especially with Ace being closed there, um, it, it kind of seems a little decrepit. A lot of the businesses uh, that closed during the pandemic have not been replaced yet, but uh, that doesn't mean that the potential for, for just one nice pedestrian-friendly street downtown um, isn't worth uh, fighting for. Uh, certainly, um, I, I can imagine a lot of a lot of benefits to having more of that uh, in downtown Davis uh, rather than less. So, um, personally, I think that option two is uh, is the clear winner for me here. Um, although, option four uh, theoretically worth exploring. I'm not sure quite how that would work, uh, or if there would be. I don't really know what the plans are. Uh, for um, the space currently that used to be occupied by Ace Hardware. Um, but uh, really option two seems the, you know, the the, uh, the obvious pick. Great. Thank you. Commissioner Ustum? Yeah, I'd just also like to say, I think option two is probably the one I would support. Um, well, it is the one I would support. I think it's a pretty dynamic space. Um, I do a lot of business on G Street, um, go to Copyland very frequently was over at the artery, um, also several of the other businesses along there. I, I understand parking is always an issue when it comes to businesses, but it's been my experience in the downtown. I'm very rarely ever parking in front of the business I'm actually going to. So the idea of having to maintain some sort of parking immediately in front of a business to be successful, I, I just don't find that argument very compelling. Um, I think the worst option here is option three. Um, drivers don't like uncertainty. Um, I think it's just an invitation for us to have an ongoing discussion on next door about how the city can't decide what to do with the street. Um, but I would, I would like to see the commission support uh, option two um, and move forward with maintaining that as a, as a dynamic uh, space for the city. And I think that the um, businesses along there are more than willing to uh, upgrade the look of that given some standards and some certainty that they're going to be able to maintain that that space. Great. Thank you. Commissioner Kumar. Thank you. Um, I think that my comments are mostly going to echo what everyone else has already said. Um, I love that G Street is closed um, as an individual. I think that as someone who always has to drive to G Street when I want to access it because of where in Davis I live. Um, it's not particularly inconvenient to find parking in the general vicinity of the region that I'm trying or to the business that I'm trying to go to. I was trying to think of a time where I was inconvenienced enough 
to where it would help me at least make a comment the other way. And I couldn't think of a time. Um, so option two has my support, but this is a good time, I think, to consider disability access. Um, I was trying to do a little bit of research about it, wasn't able to find anything. And Ryan, if you have your own research that you've done, that would be helpful. But there should be a way for folks who are disabled to access the business businesses that they want to more easily than just having to rely on basically walking towards the business. Um, whether that means a disabled or handicapped parking spot that's closer, or it means a solution that I have not been creative enough to think of. Um, if we're going to have this conversation about a more permanent solution, I think that this is the time to consider uh, that community as well. Um, I appreciate all the other commentary, but if we're going to have a permanent solution, we need to consider all everybody. So um, with that, Ryan, uh, you can put my tally mark next to option two, and um, I'll let Commissioner Lee speak, but I'm also prepared to make the motion to support option two. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Lee? Uh, hi. So uh, joining uh, with the crowd, uh, option two, uh, I really like the car-free zone on G Street. And um, one thing I would add is this sort of uh, hodgepodge, uh, I think uh, uh, Commissioner Campbell described it as janky. Uh, I, I think I'm too old to use that word. But uh, there is an aspect of the way this is sort of set up, which sort of lends itself to not necessarily a great visual and uh, open experience for folks. So within option two, so fully support option two, uh, we have a couple examples. We have Burgers and Brew, which is uh, at the time that was done, this was sort of uh, done as sort of a parklet. And we also have an example in front of the Davis Creamery, which is also kind of a parklet. This idea that uh, businesses kind of realize like, wow, if we had space for outdoor dining, this could benefit us and make a better experience for our customers. Those two models are substantially different in that if I just bring my sack lunch and want to sit down in the seating in front of Davis Creamery, I can. It's open to all. Whereas if I showed up with a pizza from Woodstock's, you know, uh, using the example uh, from earlier uh, uh, from Commissioner uh, Kumar, I believe it was, or maybe it was Mills, uh, maybe I actually should take taken better notes. But anyway, uh, if I show up with a pizza, the people at Burgers and Brew are like, what the heck are you doing here? You can't eat here. This is for our customers only. If we want to make this a nice, cohesive place that, you know, has good, you know, access for folks, um, you know, disability access is a good point from Commissioner Kumar. Maybe we rethink how this is done rather than each individual business kind of go and plop their little space down in front of their, their place. What if during, if this car-free section of G Street, we want a good visual experience. We want the person in Copyland to be able to bring their food from home and just go plop down on some seating and meet their friends who've grabbed, you know, beer or soda or food or not food and just enjoy the space that it doesn't have to be, oh, I'm in front of the beer shop. So I, and my friends, if I want to sit with my friends there, they can't show up with the Woodstock's pizza there. Right. And so that's the only thing I would add, which is, I think by having this more in control of the city and that it's open to all, and it's not sort of a little, this is my zone, you know, restaurant A, this is my zone. You can't eat here unless you buy from me. And then the, the, the people, um, you know, the, the retail shops, I mean, wouldn't it be nice if the folks at the artery could go sit down and have a nice discussion sitting on a bench? not having purchased any food in the in mid morning, right? So this would directly benefit them right now. If they decided, hey, we're going to go, let's have a little staff meeting. Let's go outside and sit in one of these tables. Technically, I don't think they can because it's kind of a, a private implementation of space. So that would be the thing that I would suggest that uh, 
we convey to the that is brought up to the city council like here's a way that might address some of these concerns that some of the shopkeepers have expressed anyway so that's it but yeah thanks i think a good word for you brett is mall food court <laughs> <laughs> So I'd have to push back a little bit uh, related to this, this idea of mall food court kind of has a negative connotation. Well, it's a shared right? space, though, where anyone can go sit at any time it was in the mall. There's no like. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, free I, space. I agree. Yeah. So uh, in that way. Yeah. Uh, uh, a public shared space. Exactly. So. Uh, but yeah, uh, I think sometimes the word matter matters. So like the um, you know some of the the people who spoke talked about closure, kind of having this connotation. Yeah, it, I like the car free zone, and I really enjoy it. And you know, cars have access to ninety nine percent of Davis, and so the fact that a, a small portion of G Street is car free, and you can walk around and not have to worry about cars knocking you over, that's a nice thing. Mm -hmm. I agree. Well, this has been a really robust discussion. Thank you, everybody, for <laughs> your active participation and your thoughts. Um, a couple of items of feedback I have for you, Ryan, in terms of you know the options. Um, one, I do think that feedback from the public is really important. There are so many people affected by this decision, and it seems like you know this has been come up with primarily based on a limited set of feedback, um, perhaps primarily from the businesses. And I think that being able to have a sense of the um, wider opinions within the community is important to consider in something like this. The second is that you started with four key you know, areas of concern, which I think is really helpful. Um, and then I agree with the public commenter in which the one area of concern of the access of cars seems to really dominate the options that are proposed. Um, three out of the four options address that one concern. And it's not clear um, what other concerns are addressed under the options. So I would like to see a little table here in this slide where you have the options and you map those to the concerns and um, show which concerns are addressed by each option. So given, you know, given the four options as they are, I agree with what sounds like everybody else um, with option two, because I actually think that that addresses the most of the four concerns. Um, and the, the concerns about the appearance is something that can be addressed. I think that that should also be described in option two. Why is it only focused on, you know, if it's open to automobile traffic or not? It sounds like this would be an option that would keep it open to a variety of types of traffic, excluding automobiles, but it would also beautify it, put in some standards, um, and, you know, address some of those other concerns that were raised. So I think Commissioner Kumar mentioned wanting to make a motion. Is that yeah, uh, thank you, um, Commissioner Jacobson. I yeah, I will go ahead and make the motion. But before I do, um, Ryan, do you want some time to respond before we make motions here? I know I think I asked you a question. Commissioner Jacobson asked you a couple of questions. Um, yeah, so I can follow up with a couple of things. I jot, jotted down the notes about ADA access and specifically looking at adding additional ADA parking near the part, portion of G Street that we're trying to keep car free, or looking at keeping car free. Um, and I, I will be following up on that and looking what our, at our options are there. One of the things that would need to be addressed as part of a further development of a concept for G Street would be ADA access, especially at the mid-block locations. We've been using a bunch of ramps right now, and that would probably need to, whatever the ultimate concept is, be looked at and revised accordingly. As far as the options and how they address or uh, some of the concerns, um, I think options two and four really do help address kind of the permanence 
of some of the issues that we've seen out there as far as cleanliness or its appearance. They would allow the city to develop standards and implement them to kind of clean up those issues. We've also heard, um, when I was doing my walkthrough, I heard from quite a few businesses that there's a reluctance to invest in what they've got out there, specifically because they don't know how long it's gonna be in place. And they view investing five or $10,000 into making something that's a little more appealing only to have it be removed by the city three or four months later isn't a wise investment. You guys threw a few questions at me. Um, if there's any that you want me to follow up on, please let me know. One, one question that might be a little bit basic. These options that are before us, was that, prim did you prepare these options yourself or? Is there some influence from other departments? Or I guess I'm just wondering how we got to these four options. That seems to be a recurring question. So the majority of these options are, I mean, whether or not to reopen it to automobile traffic or keep it uh, car free, I think those are just kind of the recurring obvious ones. The other two have really come out of discussions, either previous items before the city council or other ideas that have come from other groups or agencies. Got I, it. No, go ahead, please. Um, and just, I think the other comment that popped up that I jotted down was concerns about option three and reopening the road. The full closures. I, I agree that having a road that's intermittently opened or closed without any like frequency or set schedule really does drive a lot of confusion, not just for automobile drivers, but everyone is trying to access the road and figure out what it is. I've worked in several communities where roads have had to be regularly closed to automobiles for farmers markets or other activities that we tend to do in the park. And for the most part, those things have all been figured out. And as long as there's consistency to that schedule, I think it is something that would be workable. Thank you. Um, thanks for answering all those questions. I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and make the motion to support option two, keep the street closed to automobile traffic um, with our notes that we would like to look into um, disability access. Um, yeah, and that's the extent of my motion. Mr. Aston? I'd like to second the motion. Okay, is there any discussion? Commissioner Lee? Um, yeah, I was wondering if you guys would accept a friendly amendment that you um, mentioned the possibility of, you know, uh, could the possibility of public access be investigated, right? So, I mean, staff would be familiar with the different models. As I said, uh, in front of Davis Creamery, there is public access versus um, Burgers and Brew where there's not public access or maybe public access, wrong word, is the seating is not reserved for customers only. I mean, How about sh shared space? Would that be a good word, Brett? Uh, I I'm open, but just this, this notion that I could go and, you know, bring up my lunch bag and book and go sit in one of the spaces and enjoy the space. Obviously not being disruptive, not, you know, leaving it in worse condition than when I found it. Um, but, but as an open question, so it just doesn't follow the existing model, which is the spot in front of the business. You or that business pays for it, builds it, and it's just for their patrons only. Um, again, not saying it has to be that way, but at least ask the question. Right. So I have support option to look into disability access and explore shared space, no private tables. I think we need a response from Commissioner Kumar as to whether that friendly amendment would be accepted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the maker of the motion definitely accepts the friendly amendment. And I think that um, when Jennifer, when that's published in writing. I think that Commissioner Lee's um, examples of creamery versus burgers and brew 
okay. really does indicate the difference um, in the two models and I think would be helpful to illustrating what we're getting at when we say that because I think it's a really good point that the same you know the same set of benches in front of three mile can be used by the folks from the coffee shop three mile even Kathmandu's and everyone can be sitting together and then I can ride up on my bicycle not purchase anything and sit with them whereas if it was the burgers and brew style they would ask me why I was there. If I wasn't ordering anything, they would ask why someone was eating Indian food there. And they would ask who brought beer that wasn't from their brewery. So <laughs> I totally agree with Commissioner Lee and I happily accept that amendment. Got it. <laughs> and uh, if I could sort of look at that also, I don't know that it necessarily has to be um, either or in terms of uh, sh uh, sort of shared space or um, dedicated space to, to one restaurant um comes to mind and i know it's not a it's not a huge space g street but it is potentially expensive enough um what came to my mind was thinking about um several squares uh i've been in um in mo mostly in europe but where maybe there's a little space right outside a restaurant that kind of belongs to that restaurant but then deeper into the um square there's space that's more broadly public um, I don't know, uh, you know, I, obviously I haven't gone and measured out there to see where you could have sort of public space mixed with private space, but in my um, sort of understanding of permanently modifying this space to be a pedestrian zone, um, I, I, I would imagine that, that there are opportunities to do that. Great. Yeah, I would just like to comment. I I like the friendly amendment. I think it's good to explore. And I also like that it's phrased as an exploration because I agree with Commissioner Campbell that, you know, perhaps there's possibilities to do both. And there may also be budget implications. You know, somebody mentioned that a restaurant may want to invest more if it's something that's going to bring more business to their restaurant and that may help in the beautification versus does the city have the money to really make it an open space in the entire street in a way that's attractive for everybody. So I like the proposal to explore the options, but for it to be an exploration and to be able to look at um, the pros and cons. Jessica, are you ready to go to a vote? There are no more comments. Any other comments on this? Real, no. real quick, who was the second? It was Brooke. Yeah, if I, I'm happy to accept the friendly amendment. Thank you. Okay, I think we can go to a vote. Okay, Skylar. Aye. Andy. Aye. Jessica. Aye. Keshav. Aye. Brett. Aye. Jackson. Aye. Brooke. Aye. All right, great. I'll write it up nicely, but we we all know what it is sort of right now. <laughs> cool. Oop. Second. Okay. I'm just going to leave it like this. Ryan, you take it away, and then I could br bring up the letter when you're ready. Um, yeah, so this is um, an item that was agendized out of your subcommittee to talk about the MACE letter of concern. I believe the draft that we have is something that Jennifer is going to be able to show in a second. And I don't think I have a lot to present on this. Oh, sorry. But in general, your commission was concerned about the lack of a cycle track along a portion of the west side of Mace Boulevard and had drafted this letter uh, as an update on where we are with the project. We are, we have received the 100% plans from the consultant and are looking at if there are any final revisions or changes that need to be made anticipate it going to the city council either in February or March for consideration. Uh, 
and I believe Brooke was on the, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I was going to say if it's appropriate at this point. Um, so this was initially drafted by Commissioner Kovachev, um, and I weighed in on this and then made some um, edits after some discussion with him. Uh, the, yes, the letter was to express some concern about the fact that we were not going to continue the cycle track on the west side, even though this had been an issue that had been brought up by a number of residents, particularly those with school-aged children who are, because of the current design, are being asked to cross over, um, I believe, at San Marino to head north, even though a lot of them are still continuing to go north, um, even though it's, it's ostensibly a one-way track. There was some discussion of, well, with signage and enforcement, which just didn't really seem appropriate for particularly the children are trying to use that to reach Pioneer or other schools um, going that direction. Uh, that it seemed to make more sense to just encourage the natural flow of that, which would be safer for, for students um, taking that route. Uh, one of the reasons for the not being able to accommodate that was that we had decided the decision was made to go to two lanes from um, Cowell down to uh, San Marino, which appeared to preclude the fact that we could do the cycle track. I think that's something that needs to be reconsidered. Even in the discussion we had with Fair and Piers, it was noted that the, uh, the traffic numbers going south on there are pretty minimal. Um, so whether that's really an accommodation, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that it was, you know, we're gaining a lot by opening up that uh, lane. I do understand that we're at 100% plans. Um, this is certainly a suggestion to the city council to consider this as an option for changes that may be noted. Um, you know, this seems to be a project that that has a lot of potential for things to be modified as it goes along, and would certainly like this to be a consideration. So, um, so now we move to clarifying questions. Commissioner Kumar. Yeah, Ryan, this is probably due to my not completely understanding the process, but with um, the plans from the consultant being at 100% as opposed to being at 65% when we had begun discussing this agenda item, how much does that affect how likely it is? Or how much does that affect how much turmoil this could potentially cause to the planning of the project um, if the city council were to um, be receptive to it. Does that make sense? I just want to know, you know, will they hear it out? And if they do, how much impact will it have on the project and the timeline? I'm not sure. I'm not sure how the council would respond. Um, right. As far as the, as far as what the, things I can discuss about well, this would result in a delay in the project. We'd have to go to a redesign. It would probably result in an increase in the design costs and we'd have to budget or adjust, come up with a budget and come up with some sort of an amendment to the designer's contract. A couple of the concerns that resulted in this decision being made as part of the initial project was it would require the removal of some trees and the reconstruction of the existing curb between the sidewalk and or the bike path and the sidewalk there's a bit of a landscape easement along part of it that would be removed which would result in the tree removal as far as what we're changing and modifying at least portion of this between cal and el Macero, wouldn't result, what we're doing right now would not result in significant changes. We're not building anything that would have to be removed if at some point in the future we decided to install the cycle track. There would be some median curb removal and some lane adjustments for the portion between El Macero and San Marino. They're not part of the project now, so we were not making substantial changes to those curbs except near the intersections. And that would have to be done. But again, it's not something this new project is actually touching. So we are not, the new project wouldn't be building much that would be a lost cost or thrown away 
if at some point down the future things changed and we decided to put it in. If that helps. It does, thank you. Commissioner Ostrom. I, I understand this would be a, you know, certainly be an amendment to the uh, engineer's contract on this. Um, I guess my question is, when is this scheduled to go out to bid? And does that, and is this fully funded already for the improvements that are identified? It is not fully funded. Um, we're only funded through design. So I'm not sure when it would go to bid. I'm not sure if this is something that would be paid through some funding source that the council would allocate when the project is presented to them, or if it's something that would be delayed for future grant funding or how it would move forward. Thank you. Commissioner Furla. So uh, kind of, I guess piggybacking on uh, Brooke's question there, uh, are there any uh, specific funding sources that are being looked at or have been discussed uh, for, for uh, executing, for delivering this project? Not that I'm aware of. There might be something that was discussed through a CIP meeting, but at the moment it's not funded. Nothing's really been identified as a potential source. Thank you. If there are no more clarifying questions, we can move to public comment. Okay, at this time, anyone from the public can speak about this item by raising their hand or pushing star nine on their phone. All right, seeing none. Okay, then we can move to commissioner discussion. Commissioner Lee. Um, yeah, so I, I have some familiarity with this. Um, and the background is over two years ago, the council was ready to fund changes to this uh, corridor to kind of um, undo some of the problematic design features. Um, and so my sense is the council will be in a little bit of a pickle with this letter. I really like the letter. I think there is um, a lot to be said for a two-way cycle track on the west side, uh, given kind of the where the where the people are coming from and where they're interested in going. Um, but my sense is the council, we have the council liaison here. The council is probably very interested in having this go out to bid as soon as possible. And ideally approving the, the uh, you know, when a bid, bids come back that are responsive, that they're able to fund it and actually get construction started on it this uh, spring, summer. Um, so my, so you kind of create this while council is would be supportive of the idea. They're they're kind of feeling pressure from the clock or the calendar. So I just sent Jennifer uh, an email. Do you want me to if, open it, Brett? Yeah, if you're able to share that. And yeah. and so this would be. Uh, I would propose that this be sort of an addendum to what the letter says. So no changes to the letter, but essentially giving us a second bite at the apple, which is. Okay, we kind of and and you you may not support this because it does give them a little bit of an out, but the out brings the BTSSC a chance to be involved with. Okay, you've constructed this. What do we see? What do we observe? What are what are some things that we see that would actually make this a better segment for bikes and pedestrians? And so the idea would be we ask council to set aside a little money because without money set aside, then, you know, it becomes problematic. But actually by plan, hey, now it's BTSSC's chance to take a look at what was implemented. Here's what we observe. And at that point, um, you know, from what I understand from um, um, Ryan, that the two-way cycle track is not precluded from any of the kind of the 
concrete that's going in in this phase. So again, strategically, you might wish to just kind of do all or nothing and really not give a kind of easy uh, out. Uh, but to me, I feel like the time pressure is on the council and they would be probably very uncomfortable about delaying this by a couple of months, specifically because these months are crucial in order to get a bid back and actually get construction started during the construction season before sort of fall winter hits. Um, again, the council liaison is here. Um, we could potentially get a temperature read, but again, I'm a new commissioner. I, I missed a lot of the backstory, uh, but I really do like the way the letter was written and what it said. I, I just, um, yeah, anyway, you, you, you get, you kind of understand. So it, it's, I, I'm not trying to undercut the letter. I just, uh, you know, the goal would be, let's get this segment uh, right. And so if they're willing to set aside some money and give us a chance to take a look, then, then that seems okay. The fact that it might be delayed by some number of months or a year uh, is probably uh, less important in the big picture. Jessica, do you want to allow Gloria to speak? I was just thinking that, yeah. Thank you. Um, so I, I have to say that I was one of the folks that was, you know, a real fan of the two-way cycle track on that side of the street when this was first proposed. Um, and, uh, and so when we had this discussion, I think we discussed uh, that this was not an option that was off the table, but rather something that was going to be delayed and that we um, needed to get this first part of the, you know, this first phase of the project done because this is, as everyone knows, has been very controversial and has caused a lot of angst in that part of town. And we wanted to sort of just get through these um, first uh, fixes as quickly as possible. And so I, you know, I very much appreciate the fact that you are pushing for this. I don't think that, um, you know, there, that the, that everything will be stopped in order to, in, you know, to, in order to put this feature in. But I do think that having this letter on board and having, um, you know, an option sort of holds it, right? It puts a placeholder there so that this doesn't just disappear um, and, and, and get forgotten. And I think that that's a really important, um, uh, it's, you know, it's really important that that get done. So Commissioner Lee, are you making a motion at this point or are you presenting this as, as an idea? Uh, uh, well, well, as a, a new commissioner, I, I just thought um, I would, would add this into the discussion. So I'm not I'm not making a motion. I, I don't feel it's appropriate for me to make a motion when the commission has been at some level been working on this prior to my arrival. It really, I think, would be um, Commissioner Ostrom and, and you know and the rest of the commissioners. Um, I trust their judgment to figure out whether they think this would be an appropriate addition to the letter or an inappropriate. So you know, I'm, I'm really curious to get their take on it, because because again, I'm not trying to undercut the letter. I I really like the letter. I'm just thinking from a practical perspective, making sure that ultimately good design features are incorporated into the design. Okay, Commissioner Farilla. Thank you. Uh, so uh, so my so. Uh, one, I'd like to uh, thank the subcommittee for their work on this uh, letter. It definitely, yeah, definitely reads really well. I'm just kind of, I'm just coming in at the uh, tail end here, but uh, this is a great job, and I definitely am supportive of it uh, going to council. Uh, one wording change I would suggest, if uh, you can go back to the uh, letter, sure. So I can. Thank you. So it's in that uh, second paragraph uh, okay. where. It where it discusses, uh, where it says that uh, talks about the changes that were made in the original project in uh, 2018, and then saying that uh, right now it reads that those changes resulted in uh, traffic con 
congestion from vehicles using uh, the route as a diversion around uh, I-80. I think that uh, one thing just to be, I think that wording could be adjusted just because it's, I mean, the bike lanes themselves with the, the road diet and the bike lanes aren't causing the congestion. I mean, there's also, there's congestion on Mace, like beyond the bike lanes between between uh, Cowell and Childs, where there's no, there's no bike lane at all. There's that really bad congestion on Mace on Mace during those peak hours, like north of I-80, where there's no protected bike lanes, and also like down road 30, like down Childs Road and road 32A, where there's like minimal to no uh, bike infrastructure. Uh, so again, I think just making it clear that the, that the bike lanes are not what I think there might be some drivers who see those bike lanes and when they're on that, that stretch of Mace, they blame the congestion on them. When in fact, this is, I mean, this is about the choke point on I-80 going towards the Yolo Causeway. And more broadly, the fact that if the, the limits on that there's not more like regional and inner city transit options connecting the Bay Area to Sacramento, or maybe we do have a decent option between the Bay and Sacramento with the Capital Corridor, but especially like going east from Sacramento, a lot of those drivers are going up into the mountain where uh, the rail and bus service going east from Sacramento is quite limited. So therefore they drive, like leaving to all, all this, and then the causeway is like a natural geographic choke point where you have all of this congestion. Uh, so I think just really being clear about the wording there, especially because my concern that uh, should this project go forward, that uh, even if there are more traffic lanes put in, it's not going to actually do anything to solve this problem because what's going to happen is more, it's just, it's just going to lead to more inner city drivers using it, just going to make Mason even more appealing uh, diversion route for Bay Area drivers heading to Sacramento in the mountains because it's, just, it's essentially just going to function as another auxiliary highway lane. So I think something to highlight uh, to really emphasize those concerns and how because that really just puts in contrast that putting in the cycle track, that's something that really could be beneficial for local transportation. The traffic lanes, not so much. That'll be something that mainly serves Bay Area drivers. So that's my two cents there is just looking at uh, just, I think, Re-examining that wording to be clear that uh, again the traffic is a, it's a really a result of a regional transportation choke point, not about a few blocks of protected bike lanes. Thank you, Commissioner Aston. Yeah, um, Commissioner Friller, I, I appreciate your concern on that. I think that the statement there is still pretty accurate. It was the you know after the construction of um, the improvements what sort of initiated the changes were people particularly in El Macero uh, were that the reduction lane reduction had, had given the appearance of the a longer queue in there that was in front of them so it was not just in it you know when we're saying it was the number of track the reduction the number of traffic lanes the dedicated bike lanes the intersection redesigns all these contributed to what was a perception of an issue in the in the, in the corridor um, you know, there, there's a lot of issues there, obviously, but I, I think that this was just trying to say that, you know, there was an existing condition, the conditions were changed, the changes then initiated this process to make further changes to change the way that the traffic was perceived in the corridor. Um, so I, I'm not sure wordsmithing that's going to really change the, the, I appreciate the, the concern, but I don't think that wordsmithing is really going to change the, the you know the direction of how the how this project proceeded um with regards to the letter in general i would really appreciate if commissioner lee would make a make a motion on this i appreciate your insight into how we can better sort of um as it was said that we can keep this in front of the the city council i realize that 100 percent plans we are kind of very late the game to be making these kind of suggestions but if there is the opportunity um, in the future for this to, you know, for changes to be made, for other changes to be incorporated in this project going forward, if we can, you know, make sure that this is still on the city council's um, radar in terms of things that could be improved, and the idea of having us take another look at this once some of the, the phase one or phase one A is completed. I would, I think that's great. And I would really look to you with your experience and insight on this to maybe help us shape uh, a message on this that could, you know, get this in the, get, get this moving in the right direction. Um, one question for Ryan though, uh, in terms of like being on the clock or what the timeline for this is, uh, 
can you advertise, can you put this out for bid until you've secured your funding source? I mean, my understanding is that you have to have a funding source identified before you can put this out for public bid in terms of the, uh, the construction portion. And you're right. We have to have a funding source before we can go out to bid. If the city decides to fund this through local funds, this could be done at the meeting where the council sees the plans and they could through a budget adjustment process actually provide the funding for it. Okay, great, thank you. Commissioner Campbell. Uh, <clears throat> yes, I just wanted to um, address one thing that uh, Commissioner Ferrillo mentioned. So while I uh, agreed with probably more than 95% of, uh, of what um, he had to say about, um, you know, the the reality being that these cho this natural choke point um, is, is going to be there geographically and that we have, uh, you know, poor transit options, frankly, to connect um, the Bay Area to Sacramento, as well as to connect frankly, Davis to Sacramento, even. Um, the, the fact is, is that although we have an imaginary bubble above Davis that we live in, um, it's not an actual bubble. And many of us, myself included, are um, essentially forced to, to drive because we live, we work in some part of Sacramento that is not served by, uh, by and so it is, it is Davis residents as well. Frankly, a lot of Davis residents that I know um, happen to live, happen to work in Sacramento. Sorry, I think I cut out there for a moment. But um, so I would say that the the, uh, the transit part of the, the transportation part of the picture um, is something as someone who doesn't have any uh, real background on this specific um, project having just joined the commission. Um, I, I can't say with certainty um, that I think that uh, the, the two-way bike lane necessarily um, it serves more Davis residents than uh, the project as is. Um, so that said, uh, you know, I don't know that there's harm in allowing council to consider a letter, but um, it's it's unclear from my you know, brief exposure to this project, um, how many residents necessarily uh, benefit from the way that it is versus the way that the letter would, um, would, would prefer the project to, to be designed. Okay, thank you. Did I just saw a hand go up, Commissioner Furla? Thank you, uh, and thanks, uh, thanks for the follow-up comments, uh, Commissioners Ostrom and uh, Campbell. So uh, I think that if we're taking your comments to a uh, heart, I think one thing just in terms of uh, moving this project uh, through the process is that, uh, like I know that like, I mean, if the project is, if, if the current design is, is um, that is what moves forward and the city pursues funding on that, because, uh, and this is a question, feel free uh, staff to uh, chime in on this as well, that because I mean it's something that I mean the current like it wouldn't lead to any improvements to the current like bike infrastructure, but it would be putting in uh, new traffic lanes. So is this something that would need to go through like a full blown like sequel review, and, uh, and especially because this would actually be put it would actually result in more traffic lanes than uh, Mace had before anything was done like before 2018. So is this something that would need like a sequel analysis that could potentially hold it, hold it up? And if so, uh, what role could uh, better bike and could like a side could like a cycle track or some other improvement to bicycle infrastructure uh, play in possibly expediting that you know i don't know what the environmental document is on this it might be something that was considered under the original environmental document or there might be some sort of an update or extension being used for it Okay, I don't see any more um, hands raised. Would anybody like to make a motion? Again, I'd love to suggest that Commissioner Lee make a motion on this. Commissioner Lee, I see your hand raised. Oh, well, I mean, as the original um, author of the letter, I, I would think Commissioner Ostrom would you know, 
you, you would, I think, be the natural person to, you know, make a motion to send the letter to council with, um, if you if you like what I've written or perhaps some variation of it, you know, with the added language that I submitted. Uh, I, I, again, I feel a little bit awkward making the 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 motion having just shown up. To, you know, this is my first meeting, and and you're actually the the author of the letter, so. Well, I, I'd be happy to make the motion to um, to move. I'd like to move that we convey this letter to uh, the city council, um, and along with the letter to incorporate um, the direction that Commissioner Lee has put in the email about how this could be considered by the city council. Uh, and I'm happy to second that. And, and I would ask perhaps um, perhaps Ryan Chapman might weigh in on does the language and what I've added does that kind of fit into it like something that you believe would be actionable by the council? I mean, perhaps the wording could be changed so that it would be uh, more in alignment with what um, staff could. Uh, well, I guess you could. You could fine tune it when it actually gets presented to council. You could do sort of an interpretation. So, but I think you get the gist of of what the addendum is sort of seeking. Um, but what's your take on the addendum? Does it seem like something that would be workable and um, clear to staff and you know doable by the council? Well, actually, let me rephrase that. Um, is what's being asked seem reasonable from your professional? position and then uh, is it relatively clear so yes it seems reasonable and it is relatively clear the only thing i would add is that that a minimum of two hundred thousand is allocated to investigate or to construct the west side cycle track is well that... actually i actually purposely left it open as to what improvements so okay. when we actually see the the phase one complete we might discover and we look at the sort of the patterns of the people using um, of the street, we might actually discover that there might be other improvements that would be um, more important to implement than perhaps a two-way cycle track. So I think this gives the BTSSC a, a little more latitude in terms of what we observe and what we recommend. Yeah, that makes sense to me. And based on the way this is written my intent would be to go up, up complete phase one once traffic is stabilized in schools and fashion evaluate pedestrian and bicycle activity along the corridor see where they're going how they're using the facilities and bring a report back to the btssc yes <laughs> okay is there any additional discussion All right. Jennifer, can we take it to a vote? Yep, Skylar. Aye. Uh, Andy. Aye. Jessica. Aye. Keisha. Aye. Brett. Aye. Jackson. Aye. And Brooke. Aye. Great. Excellent. Thank you all. All right. Seven C. All right, I'm just going to exhibits. So this one's me again. Um, so SACOG is working on a maintenance and modernization grant round that's due at the end of the month. And I'm looking for your support, or I'm looking for one, your feedback on a project that we are looking to apply for. And if you support the project, a letter of support, which has been attached and instructing the chair to sign that letter. And just a bit of background, then I was gonna work through the striping plan and kind of go through some of the features that we're trying to build into this. So we actually looked at three corridors before we selected Cal. We looked at Lake, Loyola, and then this portion of Cal. And why Cal was selected because it looked like it would be the most competitive for this grant funding cycle. It was looking like it was the most competitive for a number of reasons. The first one is it's got a pavement, it's got a low PCI. So there's a pavement condition 
issue here and part of the maintenance and modernization funding is really to keep existing infrastructure in a state of good repair. So it could fund an overlay and a rehabilitation of this road. There is a collision history on Cal and some of the treatments that we are looking at would help reduce those collisions. And there is a bike connection that could actually be made here that would actually benefit both the community and score well with that. And that bike connection is part of the research and I-80 project. There's a multi-use trail that is gonna end at research, sorry, at Richards and I-80 project. Mm -hmm. The multi-use trail is gonna end at Cal and research where the mouse is. And then bicycles would be directed into the bike lanes that are currently on the street. Part of this project would be to put in a cycle track and take that down to the Safeway driveway where the multi-use trail picks up again. Um, what is missing from this exhibit? Unfortunately, just because of the time constraints on this and we've got a pretty compressed schedule, this is kind of first draft of a striping plan to prove that we can fit all the features we were looking for into the roadway. It doesn't really get into the treatments at the intersections, and it doesn't show the bus stops and any transit improvements that would need to be made, which especially in the area with the cycle track are probably going to be things like floating bus stops or enhanced pads. Every time I've driven down this uh, corridor when school is in session, especially in the mornings when everyone's headed to school, all those bus stops are filled with uh, people that are trying to get on the bus. And the Unitrans is running 30 minute headways for the bus service here. And we want to try to accommodate and encourage that as much as possible. And like I said, the grant is due at the end of the month. And unfortunately, we don't have another PTSS state meeting between here and there. So I wanted to get this before you and get your feedback now. So, if we could go back to the top of the striping plan, yep. Jennifer, it would be appreciated. So like I said, starting here, we're picking up a cycle track. With the width of the street, we're able to accommodate the straight the cycle track, a bike lane on the other side of the road, two travel lanes, a two-way left turn lane, and parking on both sides of the road. One of the benefits we have here is we've got some road right away, right away and we can actually fit everything. There are a couple high volume driveways, like the driveway for this apartment complex and where the cycle track is actually going to be crossing that driveway. Um, yeah, and then the one on the top panel as well. There, where the cycle track is crossing those driveways, there will be green paint going through and there will be probably the elimination of that parking and push things out to increase visibility and sight distance so everyone can see what's going on. Most of these intersections that are signalized in the cycle track crosses, we're going to be considering bicycle phasing so that the cycle track is actually on dedicated uh, greens and that will help actually accommodate crossings to and from the cycle track from the side streets as well. Can I get the next page, please? This driveway at um, the Safeway right there is where the cycle track would end and there would be phasing directing pedestrians onto the multi-use trail that is on the south. Actually, there's a multi-use trail on the north as well that ends at that intersection. So the bicycle phasing would incorporate that so that we can take pedestrians and bicyclists from both sides of the road and bring them onto the cycle track. This is another location where we'll be looking at other signal enhancements to encourage that. The intersection of pole line, we would be doing a traffic study as part of the grant to analyze the free rights and the actual needs for the intersection to see if there's an opportunity to reduce the area of this intersection, possibly remove some of those free rights, possibly remove one of the lanes in the northbound direction on pole line, shorten up some of those pedestrian crossings. Um, and then beyond that intersection, we would be looking at buffered bike lanes and three travel lanes, or sorry, two travel lanes, one in each direction, and a two-way left turn line, taking us at least to Research Park here and possibly farther to where Hyatt House has done the pavement work and actually reconstructed there. The grant 
is up to $5 million plus the city's match. And I'm still waiting for cost estimates to see how far that money would carry us. So again, um, that, that's essentially what the grant would be looking at. And that's what we'd be looking at doing. I'm again, looking for a letter of support and any feedback that the commission might have for our changes to the grant part of the project. Okay, thank you, Ryan. Are there any clarifying questions? Commissioner Furla? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, so oh, I know you mentioned so you, you mentioned the current drawings don't highlight as much like the transit stops and uh, really how this really how uh, this will integrate with the bus service. Uh, so could you just uh, go into a little more detail on uh, on the specific bus services that use that use uh, that street and where some of the main stops are? Yeah, so. Um, Unitrans runs about one bus stop a block throughout this corridor in each direction. They're running on 30 minute headway, so there's a bus going through once every 30 minutes, especially when the school is in session. And they're running at or you know, close to or near capacity, I believe, in certain times when demand's high, they're actually running two buses during each uh, stop. And that's moving students primarily from the college back to the school. I think the stop, especially the one in front of uh, the Safeway there at Valdora, I have personally observed probably close to 60 people waiting aboard the bus in the mornings. There's a lot of high demand. And a lot of what we would be looking at for some of the bus stop design, we'd probably be, or we would be looking at fitting some floating islands in and some enhanced uh, bus stop area to accommodate those pedestrians that are dwelling. We would not be looking to move the buses into the cycle track if at all possible. And we would utilize some of that parking area to expand those bus stops and make them more Thank you. Any other clarifying questions? If not, then we can move to public comment. All right. At this time, if anyone from the public would like to talk about this item, please raise your hand or press star nine. Okay, Jessica, I don't think we're gonna have anyone speaking about it. Okay, then we can move into discussion. Commissioner Mills. Yeah, uh, thank you for the presentation, Ryan. Um, it's very informative. Um, <clears throat> I want to speak as a bus driver and express um, some possible concerns that I have um, with the proposal that I see here. There are specifically um, with the width of the uh, driving lanes, there are points where um, I would be very concerned with buses um, not having enough room to make it through some points. Um, at least in these renderings and uh, specifically the so heading eastbound immediately after the research park intersection there's an island platform there um, and then this is where the two-way cycle lane starts that looks to me to be very narrow and I worry that buses would have to enter part of that the start of that cycle lane to get through there and then the other part is between Valdora and, and pole line, uh, the Valdora intersection, the pole line and Lillard intersection on Cowell um, heading eastbound um, as well as westbound, there is uh, more. There are more island platforms in the middle of the street, and only a ten foot width in, in each driving lane in each direction. Uh, and then you have a small buffer area, and then the bike lane, um, and it's additionally on a curve. So that is. Um, very narrow for driving lane. And generally I'm in favor of reducing the width of driving lanes so that it, you know, the, so that incentivizes driving slower. But in this case, um, you know, and in the future, Unitrend is gonna be adding more service down this corridor. So you're gonna have more buses on this, on Cal in the future. Um, buses are, I believe about 11 and a half feet wide. This would mean that buses would definitely be entering part of that bike lane. And there's only that tiny buffer there 
um, which would make this uh, unsafe for our cyclists and for um, uh, and for buses to be to be traveling through that area. Um, I, I also I know this is probably going to be um, ironed out in the future, but some of the the renderings the, the renderings here are relying on outdated satellite um, uh, Im imagery, uh, specifically with Cowell and Drew. There there are um, the 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 bulb outs where the, the the curve sticks out more into the intersection that have since been implemented since this change. I'm I'm sure that will be updated in the future, but um, I just wanted to point that out as the current renderings were with the bike lanes. Um, it might be difficult with those um, those corners of the intersection that bulb out. Uh, it'd be difficult to fit the bike lanes in in the way that these renderings are showing them. So um, yeah, just some general thoughts. May I, may I ask you, Commissioner Mills, what um, does that lead to in terms of, you know, do you have suggestions based on the, on that concern? Yeah, I, I think um, I think this should be redesigned to uh, at least in 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 those portions of the of the street that are currently designated as being ten feet wide. I would like to see the driving lanes widened uh, a bit. Um, and then I know I know that that would require redesigning how the um, bike lanes would go through the those sections. But to me, that would be necessary for making that those sections of the street safer. So yeah, at, at minimum, I would like to see the, those sections of the, the driving lanes widened in the portions that I that I talked about. If I may. Um, so yeah, the standard for this road would actually be 11 foot travel lanes. And that was one of the things that we could not get tweaked before we had to publish the agenda. I would be building these travel lanes to 11 feet and we'd be accommodating that by reducing the parking lane where it is nine feet down to seven or eight feet or in some areas the buffer between the parking and the bike lane would be reduced to create that width you are right that there are some bulb outs that would have to be modified and reduced in order to accommodate the cycle cycle track at drill as well as the median island at research would have to be modified in order to accommodate those lines Thank you. That's that's really helpful. I just want to say how much I appreciate having the perspective of a bus driver here. Thank you, Commissioner Mills. Commissioner Lee. Um, yeah. So, um, just th this this would help, I think. So so my sense of this was this was sort of a preliminary concept. So the details are uh, totally adjustable, but this would be a concept so that to apply for the grant so the grant evaluators could get a sense of what is kind of the idea around this corridor for improvement um, but obviously uh, you know if buses can't fit that's an issue right and so there there's still should this grant be awarded the 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 fact that on this diagram we see 10 foot widths or seven foot widths these are all adjustable uh, but keeping with the intent of kind of making these improvements, um, is, is that correct? I mean, the fact that the grant uh, is approved and people looked at a diagram that showed a 10 foot width, that doesn't lock us in. Spe specific to that, um, the intersections that uh, cross the two-way cycle track, I mean, before, I would hope that the BTSSC would get a chance to take a look at those in detail because those can be somewhat tricky in terms of you mentioned uh, um, the phasing of the signals to have sort of a, a bike kind of phase or something like that um, because the the right let's just well in the the, the lower uh, picture that we're looking at cars traveling east turning right. Uh, to uh, south part of Drew, if you have a cyclist going on the cycle track going west, potentially that's a pretty dramatic conflict. So there would presumably, before this goes to actual to final design, the things or steps that would be incorporated to address challenges like that would be clearly specified. And so I, I was taking this as sort of a concept, but 
Um, but um, yes, what uh, Commissioner or Chair Jacobson mentioned about having a bus driver, that is super valuable because uh, having kind of somebody with kind of a real world sense of what might be a problem area, that's really helpful. Um, so you're nodding, um, uh, 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 you were nodding your head, Ryan. So I'll take that as uh, this is sort of a preliminary concept helping us to get the grant. The one specific question I did have is if you could scroll up just a smidge. Um, so the, the intersection of Research Park and Cowell and I guess Research Park, and um, I'm not sure where Richards converts to Cal, but I think it's kind of right there-ish. With the I-80 interchange redesign, does it stop uh, before the intersection or does it incorporate the intersection? I, I would wanna make sure that at some point that either this intersection is included in what you're proposing today, or it was already included in the I-80 interchange redesign from a quick, um, well, my memory is lacking, but I, I didn't know, I'm not sure what happens with this intersection. And if we're not sure, I would probably try to include this in the grant proposal. And I know time is short. Perhaps you could do what you did for the intersection of Cowell and Pole Line, which is have sort of a text box and just say, proposed improvements could be signals, turns, whatever, kind of a catch-all. And so that uh, the I-80 interchange improvement project, uh, if it sort of stops short, that there is money or available or it is within the scope. So for instance, if you're heading westbound on Cowell and you're um, wanting to make that left turn to get to the tunnel to go you know, under the Arboretum and get to downtown, that that was, is within the scope and the funds available from this grant could be used to improve that intersection. Because that intersection currently is a little bit challenging. Um, so again, I don't know whether that intersection is included in the I-80 Richards uh, interchange improvement project, but um, it would be important that somehow that interchange does have funding available, I would think. So anyway, that, that was it. Yeah. Um, so first of all, yes, this is still very schematic. It was really a proof of concept to show that we could fit something into this right away. And the second one is that Research Park, the uh, the Richards I eighty Richards project does not include improvements to the intersection. They would be included as part of this project. Uh, okay, so that inner that intersection is included in the scope, even though there's not any sort of visual call out to that fact. Correct. Unfortunately, we didn't have time to show the improvements in the intersection, but we would have to modify the signal phasing to provide bike phasing at least from the trail onto the cycle track. We would probably be looking at additional bike phasing and possibly the elimination of that free right on the top right hand side of that intersection. Okay, yeah, the, the details I'm not so concerned about. I just, it'd be nice if we needed to make improvements that the, the grant would cover expenses in that intersection. So that was it. Um, yeah, thank you. Great. Can I just hand up, um, Commissioner Furlow? Yes, thank you. So uh, first, again, just wanted to echo uh, other commissioners' comments. I mean, I think, I mean, in general, uh, this looks like a strong. This looks like a strong concept, but uh, of course, definitely does need to clearly. I mean, as it goes forward, definitely I mean, clearly making sure that uh, it, it accommodates buses and bus riders effectively is going to be key to its success. Uh, one uh, going back to the support. If you can go back to the support letter itself for a second, because there's just one little uh, again very minor thing that uh, I caught. Uh, so looking at, uh, so in that second paragraph, it says that it serves the, pri serves the primary transit corridors of uh, Unitrans W and M lines, as well as uh, Yolo bus route 44. I just wanna clarify that the 44, it hasn't run since uh, the start of COVID. Uh, and I know that Yolo bus did uh, canceled that as part of their redesign. I know there has been some talk of bringing it back at some point. Uh, so maybe just clarifying again, because it could come back at some point, still leaving some reference into it, but just making it clear, like that, maybe something along the lines of like informal and like in up until the pandemic, 
carried YOLO bus route 44, something along those lines. Great, thank you. All right, I don't see any other hands up. Um, if not, I would be happy to make a motion to um, recommend that the BTSSC supports this proposal. I'll second that. Are you making a motion that you, Jessica, have the authority to sign this letter? I thought that what Ryan wanted was for the BTSSC as a whole to support the letter. Is that correct? We need, yes, but we also need to give you the authority to sign the letter. Okay. So I'm happy to do sorry. that. That's what's helpful. Let me go here. Give the chair the authority to sign the letter on behalf of the BTSSC. Okay. Would it make more sense for somebody else to make the motion if it if that's no, part of it? You can make the motion. Okay. Then I um, would move that we that the BTSSC um, support the the letter um, and give the chair the authority to to sign the letter on behalf of the BTSSC. Great. This is Andy. I'll uh, second that motion with the friendly amend with the friendly amendment that I mentioned on uh, Yolo Bus Route Forty Four. I, I will accept that amendment. Great. And then do you want me, any discussion or are you ready to vote? Is there any discussion? Great. Hearing none. Uh, Skylar. Hi. Tom. Oh, shoot. Tom's not here. Sorry. Andy. Hi. Jessica. Hi. Uh, Keshav. Hi. Brett. Hi. Jackson. Hi. And Brooke. Hi. Great. Thank you all. One more. Right. Oh, yeah. Okay. So on this one, we've been working with the school district and setting up uh, regular meetings to discuss traffic issues around schools. We had our first one in November, then we had our second one actually earlier this week. Um, but the first school we started at was Pioneer because we had received a request or some concerns about student pickup and drop off. And one of the things we observed during that meeting was that there was a portion of the curb fronting the school that was signed for a bus stop and was not being used as a bus stop. The buses actually go into that parking lot adjacent to it and do student pick up and drop off there. So we had at this point 52 feet of curb um, that was painted red and didn't need to be. So what we're recommending is removing that paint and allowing it to be used for passenger pickup and drop off. We're also including the 32 or 34 feet of red curb on the other side. There is a driveway there that we've talked to the school about and they are not using it. It's just an old driveway that was at one point being used probably for trash pickup. Can you any questions? So uh, this is uh, Andy. Uh, so one quick, uh, quick question, just on that uh, bus stop. So uh, is there? So just could you go a little bit more into the history of that? Like, was there a time when buses used that stop, and they in uh, then they moved into the parking lot? And is there a reason that the buses, the bus service, could potentially be moving back to that stop in uh, the future? When we talked to the school district, Annie, they didn't give us any indication or interest of having buses stop on the street. They like to have them within the area that um, parents cannot access, which is the student parking area to give the, the kids getting off the bus safe access to their school site and not interacting with any other motor vehicles. The 
parking lot is now staff only and it's closed off to any parents driving into it because there there was a collision there with a, a kid and um also there was some speeding issues that were identified by teachers and so now they placed all the bus parking on site if there is a need to restore bus parking on the street for whatever reason, we would be coming back to you with an item to add a bus zone on the street wherever it is actually needed. Right, which would mean just repainting the curb and putting in the sign back up, which is fairly easy. And in all honesty, based on what I was saying out there, the color of the curb doesn't seem to matter parents were already using it for student drop off and pick up, we would just be formalizing what's occurring already. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? If not, we can move to public comment. Okay, here's one. John, go ahead. You're on mute. Sorry, I was on mute. Sure, As sorry. I said just a minute ago, Jennifer, that you had a the the school had a problem with the staff parking and they blocked it off because a child was hit and they had parents speeding in the lot. Uh, if you talk to any motorist or any pedestrian or any bicyclist, they will tell you that schools during drop off early morning and drop off or pick up later in the afternoon are the worst places to be. The traffic is horrendous. Yep. And as Ryan just admitted, they don't care about the red zone. They park there and they use it anyway. So, you know, I'm all in favor of keeping it a red zone and sending somebody out there to start writing tickets. I, I don't live anywhere near there, but I do live near Sycamore School. Mm -hmm. and, and it's the same thing at Sycamore. You can paint red curbs. You can put up no U-turn sign. And cars are everywhere. And why are cars everywhere? Because people say, oh, there's too much car traffic. We can't have our child walk to school. We can't have our child ride a bike to school. It's too dangerous. So this is how it starts. This is how it gets promulgated. It's just horrible. I say no. Thank you, John. Any other public comment? I don't see any, Jessica. Okay, then we can move to commissioner discussion. Commissioner Campbell. Uh, yeah, I'd just like to address the uh, comment we got from John. Um, obviously, none of us here are representing the school district, um, but my wife does work for it. Um, and uh, I'll just say a lot, I mean, really a lot, way more than you'd think of the students in this district um, do not live in, in Davis or not, would not be what you'd consider neighborhood students. Um, and that's for a variety of issues that, uh, frankly, this, uh, neither this city, certainly not this board, um, could really do anything about. But um, pick up and drop off by car with schools is... Uh, is is basically a certainty right now. That's something we we can't really um, prevent. So if we have a red curb for buses and there are no buses, um, I mean that's it seems like a no brainer. I think uh, I, I can't see a reason why we should be painting curbs red for buses that don't exist. It's kind of like the phantom street sweeping, um, you know. Uh, you say don't park here on so and so days because of street sweeping, uh, and then never sweep the streets, uh, which anyone who's lived in San Francisco um, will attest to is super annoying and costly. But um, that's that's all I have to say. Commissioner Astrom, um, I would definitely support removing the red curb there. Um, I live very near. To Pioneer, both of my kids went to Pioneer. Um, the 
traffic circulations at Pioneer have been an issue for at least 15 years, if not longer. And I'm hoping that there's more comprehensive solutions that'll be put in place at some point. But for purposes of this, I think having um, some additional drop off along there, since they have thankfully closed the parking lot, um, will help to some degree. And I would really support us moving forward with uh, the, re the request. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Perilla. Thank you. So just a quick comment, and again, uh, kind of piggybacking on uh, the public comment that we heard. I think that again, I mean, I don't have that. I don't have much of a stake in this game myself. I mean, I don't. I mean, I don't have much stake in my. I mean, like my <laughs> biggest connection to pioneers many years ago, having had baseball practices there. So again, I don't have that much of a stake in this game. But uh, generally speaking, I mean, I think there is like. I think there's been, I think it's like AAA actually that has that like issued some guidelines. I remember seeing where basically they say that like kids should bike or walk to school because there are too many cars near the school. So that creates too much of a risk of collisions. I mean, as it sounds like unfortunately happened at one point at uh, Pioneer. So it's just something that I think generally speaking, it's something that I think if there are, I mean, I know as uh, Commissioner Campbell mentioned, I mean, th there definitely are a lot of challenges because, I mean, cars are so ingrained in our society and there are people who do commute to school from farther away for whom, and especially again, with limited transit options, like uh, right now, there's not, I mean, there are fewer feasible options, but I think over time, I mean, definitely it is worth looking at, uh, it is worth like just looking at ways for kind of strategizing to to better to improve like biking and walking and i know like other part like in other parts of the country when I mean, school buses still play a much bigger role than they do in california in general so it's just something in general to that i think would be a worthy effort thank you commissioner campbell yeah i was just going to say um <clears throat> i don't know the exact numbers but they're so much higher than um than one might think the number of students coming from um, outside of, of the city. I, I couldn't tell you about Pioneer specifically, um, but, uh, and it's it's not just particularly close, it's not just a woodland. Uh, my wife has students uh, who come from Vacaville, West Sacramento. Um, it's, we have an excellent school district and an extremely aging population with a very small number of kids. So, you know, the district, for whatever reason, it, it chooses to, open itself to students from other communities rather than downscaling the uh, the district itself. Um, just think about the size of the city, the fact that we have three middle schools. Um, but in any case, we're not in control of that. Uh, we are in control of 86 feet of uh, red painted curb. <laughs> Commissioner Lee? Um, yeah, I am. Um... So I, I support the proposal, um, but having said that, um, having worked with the school district um, on um, Anderson Road and Cesar Chavez to address some issues there, their inclination is fairly traditional. And I imagine at some point, perhaps this commission could have a role in helping elevate people's expectations about what is possible around um, school entry points. And as you know, I'll keep it brief, but right now the entry points are the pedestrians, the cyclists, the cars, all sort of fighting for that centri central entry point. And I think um, uh, Jennifer was on the trip with me uh, where we were in Holland, and we saw that there are designs that move the cars a little further away so that the front, whether it be a train station or schoolyard, is focused on people coming by bike and foot. And the car drop-off points are further away to reduce that front of school congestion. And the design changes are not that dramatic. And uh, you know, perhaps the BTSSC can you know, keep this in the back of our mind and perhaps you know, we might be able to kind of provide a, be a resource and, and also learn for ourselves what ways we could do a redesign so that the front of the school is really geared towards the people uh, walking and biking and uh, you know good pedestrian access from the drop-off point 
but the drop-off point doesn't need to be the rock star parking. It can be a hundred yards away. You know, as we look at this design, you know, if we look at the left, you know, tree number six or something, if that's the drop-off zone, the kids have a nice, safe pedestrian access with no conflict points. So kind of the uh, the, the far left on the you know, by the field, they have a nice, safe, easy way to get onto campus without going through any conflict points. And so that might be an example where we kind of take a more holistic look at what is the drop-off function, how does it relate to the kids walking and biking to school with without you know making use of uh, automobiles. Um, and absolutely, a uh, scholar's right. Uh, it doesn't make you a bad person if uh, you come to school in a car or you drop your kid off in a car uh, with a car. Um, but you know, for the purpose of this discussion, yeah, you know, fixing the paint situation not a big deal. But in the long run, perhaps you know we could help with some of the designs just to make it uh, more safer and enjoyable for people uh, not coming by automobile. I'd be very interested in, in seeing some of those examples. That, that sounds very interesting. Commissioner Kumar? Uh, Commissioner Jacobson, has a motion been made yet? No, okay. I make a motion to support the staff recommendation in removing the, the red paint. Commissioner Campbell? I second. Is there any discussion? Okay, can we move okay. to the next Yep, Skylar. Hi. Andy. Abstain. Oh, uh, you're abstaining? Yes. Um, I abstain. Could could you make a decision and say yes or no? I think I just I or, I, abs I just I abstain because I have because I think I just I think that again I don't necessarily like I don't necessarily oppose the removing of the paint but I feel like to keep again to keep attention on the broader effort as uh, myself and other commission commissioners have mentioned to uh just the broader need to like really just kind of to take a more holistic look at access to schools and safe routes to school and stuff like that so maybe you should say no I'm just saying like abstaining um is something that the commissioner handbook wrote you know, doesn't really want you to do. They want you to make it a, a firm yes or no decision. I mean, you could abstain if you choose, but. Okay. In that case, I'll make it a no vote. All right. Awesome. Uh, Jessica. Aye. Uh, Keshav. Aye. Brett. Aye. Jackson. Aye. Brooke. Aye. Great. Thank you, everyone. All right. Where are we? Are we at the We're moving to long range calendar? Thank you, Jessica. Okay. The long range calendar is the time for commissioners to share suggestions for future agenda items after staff gives an overview of the long range calendar and we receive public comment, then we can discuss the calendar and any additions. Um, Jennifer, would you please provide an overview of the long range calendar? Uh, sure. So Tonight we saw the G Street project, the SACOG maintenance and modernization grant, a proposed red curb on Hamill Street, the Mace letter of concern, and we did um, oath of office for our new commissioners. In February, we are going to do um, subcommittee appointments and liaison appointments. So over here in the blue are our subcommittees that we have. We're going to have to actually disband our our Mace Letter of Concern subcommittee at our next meeting. We have openings in actually all of our subcommittees. Uh, we can have up to three members of for in each subcommittee. And we also have liaison appointments. And right now, um, all of our liaison appointments are full. However, we wanted to appoint uh, alternates to each of the liaisons. So if the a primary liaison is not able to attend the meeting, um, a secondary liaison can attend the meeting. So that's gonna happen in February. We're also gonna do an election for our chair and vice chair. So if you're interested in being the chair or vice chair, please um, come to the meeting and you can appoint yourself or you can appoint uh, another person as chair or vice chair. Then in March, we are bringing the Fifth Street Corridor Project, as Brian shared at the beginning of the meeting. 
there's going to be a community meeting for Fifth Street on February 2nd. So you can attend that meeting in addition to the uh, March meeting. Uh, we're also doing um, maybe the local road safety plan, and we are actually shifting the 14th Street um, to the April meeting. And the reason why we're doing that is because the community meeting for 14th Street is now going to be on March 6th, and we want to have enough time to uh, report back. And this will be our very first meeting in person. So that's happening. And then I've also did something different this time where I've taken our TBD list and I divided it by type of uh, activity. So we have our policy items that we're looking at, uh, informational items and action items. Uh, we have design standards, preferential parking policy, bike lane obstruction policy, crosswalk policy. Ryan is hoping to have the crosswalk policy to the commission next month, Ryan, I think. Is what yeah. we that was our goal. And then um, wheelchair experience, we are trying to fit that in somewhere in the summer. Uh, CIP overview, this is for our new commissioners. CIP overview is looking at how projects are funded and where the funding comes from for our different and CIP sorry is capital improvement projects so anything that is within our roadway is considered a capital improvement project it's on public property anything that's outside of our roadway is considered a development project and doesn't fall into our CIP because the city needs to fund um through grants, through city funding itself, uh, projects that are within our roadway. And then uh, we also have traffic signal upgrade technology uh, connection. And then eventually we'll have action items on Olive Drive and Davis train station. We were heard back that uh, Amtrak is still reviewing their 30% plan. So we don't have any movement there to share. Um, we're working on uh, with Unitrans on bus strap sorry bus stop upgrades and then i th think i accidentally had this twice so then i that's it any questions before we go to public comment on this one or any thoughts about how i divided it into the three sections was that helpful not helpful helpful thank you One quick uh, clarifying question is, uh, so is the bus stop upgrades item, is that going to go to the, is that going to come to, to both us and the uh, UAC? Potentially. Anything else? All right. Anyone from the public want us to be asked a question about the long range calendar? All right. Seeing no one from the public, Jessica. Okay. Then we do we move on to the next item? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, give me one second. I guess I would just like to um, comment to the new commissioners, you, you know, that your ideas are welcome for long range topics as you um, get integrated into the commission and learn more. Um, I'm hoping that additional ideas will be submitted and suggested in future sessions. So now we're on com uh, commissioner announcements. Yep. This is the time for commissioners to share any announcements they may have. This can include personal or professional announcements you wish to share with the commission or upcoming events. Um, commissioner Perilla. Thank you. So uh, a couple quick announcements, because as, as I mentioned earlier, I'm also on the uh, Citizens Advisory Committee for the Yolo County Transportation District. So uh, a couple of announcements uh, related to them is uh, so firstly, uh, coming up uh, this weekend, actually on Sunday, uh, Yolo Bus, they're adding uh, 
nine new trips to the 42A and 42B lines uh, that go to up to Woodland, the airport, Sacramento. Uh, and uh, so and that'll that's going to be a big deal. That's going to be a big deal in terms of improving uh, both local and inner city uh, transit access. Because I mean, a lot of those trips, it's going to include them in some, because uh, they're like right now, there have been some gaps because like, we've been working to address the driver shortage. So it'll help fill those by having uh, every 30 every thirty minute service in the afternoon as well as in the morning. And also it will uh, restore uh, some of the late night service so all the way until like about with the last bus leaving downtown Sacramento now, like uh, 1050 or so at night, which hasn't been the case since before the pandemic. So that'll make it like really easy to take the bus to Kings games and events downtown in the evening as well so that'll be a big deal uh so so i definitely encourage you all to uh, try that out uh Great. and then also speaking of uh the citizens advisory committee our next meeting is uh january 31st at 6 p.m so look forward to that and feel free to attend thanks sandy thank you any other announcements okay then we can move to subcommittee reports. Are there any, this is the time for commissioners who participate in subcommittees or are liaisons to other commissions and committee to share their updates. I know okay. Tom's not here for the Natural Resource Commission. Commission. Keshev, we skipped the Unitrans Advisory Committee meeting and Jessica, I don't think you attended the Tree Commission meeting. No, unfortunately I wasn't able to. All right, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> okay, um, is there a motion to adjourn the meeting? I make I'll a move that we adjourn. adjourn. Uh, I'll second that motion. <laughs> Who was it? Who first? Either way, Brooke, All you right. can have it. <laughs> Who's Commissioner Kumar? No, he's. he's Let, let's go have dinner. There. <laughs> All right, we're ending our meeting at seven fifty-eight. Do we need a Do we need a vote? I will vote. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry, uh, Skylar. Aye. Andy. Aye. Jessica. Aye. Keshav. Aye. Brett. Aye. Jackson. Aye. And Brooke. Aye. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your evening. Thanks so much. Uh, thank, thank you, you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye.